After the Second World War, Sweden was in urgent need of modern tanks. Their current medium tanks, the SDRP M42, was horribly outdated, being armed with a short-barreled 75mm gun. The Swedish military were certainly impressed by French AMX-13s and considered buying them, but eventually they concluded that their armor was too weak to fulfill their needs, along with several other flaws pointed out by General Svetlund. The deal with the French was cut off, and the Swedes eventually decided to buy the British Centurion, which offered significantly better protections against nuclear weapons and conventional weapons. However, the need for a light tank still persisted. Designing a completely new tank would take too long, around 7 years, so instead, the Swedes choose to reuse the chassis of the wartime Stridsbaken M42. Welcome to another Tank Encyclopedia first article. I'm your host, Tony. And today, I'll be covering the Stridsbaken 74. If you like what we do, remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. If you want to contribute more directly, consider donating on Patreon or Paypal. It helps us keep the lights on. The idea of upgunning the SDRV M42 had been proposed earlier, in 1944. The design would feature a new turret complete with a new gun and autoloader. The turret was named the Lat Thorn, meaning split turret because autoloading mechanism would split the turret into two separate compartments. The gun was placed far back in the turret in order to reduce the barrel overhang. A mock-up of the turret was made and tested in 1944 and was later prototyped in 1945. But tests in 1946 proved that the design was flawed. The idea to overhaul the SDRV M42 to improve its performance was brought up again in 1953. To revive this old chassis, a new turret was needed in order to fit a more capable gun. Firstly, it was considered to put the turret of the recently studied AMX-13 onto the chassis, but this was not deemed possible as the turret ring was too small. Therefore, a completely new turret was designed. The gun of choice was the 7.5cm LVKAN M36, one of the most effective Swedish heavy anti-aircraft guns. Modified as a tank gun, it was capable of penetrating 260mm of flat armor at point-blank range. In early 1954, two prototypes were ordered by the Swedish military. One of the main reasons this project was ambitiously supported by the military was the fact that the new turret modification was cheaper than buying a foreign tank, because the old M42 turrets would later be used as fortification turrets. The new turret could not reuse any of the old parts as the M42EH was only available in small numbers and suffered reliability issues because of its Volvo engine. The double engines SCRV M42TH and TV variants were chosen to mount the new turret on. The new turret had a futuristic look, being heavily sloped on all sides. Crew conditions were certainly improved over the Stridsbergen M42, with the roomier turret making operating the tank a lot more comfortable. In order to keep production simple, many of the Centurion's components were used, such as the turret traverse override, the sights, smoke dischargers, sextant, and many more. The back of the turret was occupied by an industrial Volkswagen engine, providing power through an electric generator for ventilation and heating. The unique design of the turret with a specialized gun mantlet enabled the gun to depress up to an impressive minus 15 degrees, However, the armor protection was quite disappointing, only 20mm at best. The armor was kept modest in order not to add any additional stress on the already heavily overloaded suspension. The original recoil system for the gun had to be replaced, as it was far too big to be mounted in a turret. Besides replacing the old recoil system with a new one, the barrel was slightly cut down as well. A new balancing component for the gun, invented by engineer Sven Berge, who would design the Stridsbaken 103 later in his career, was also tested and proved to be satisfactory. New armor-piercing discarding Sabo ammunition further improved the anti-armor capabilities of the gun. The hull machine gun placed on the right side of the driver was removed in order to create more room for the ammunition, as the new shells were much longer than the shorter shells the M42 used. An 8mm Kulspruta M39 machine gun was stationed on top of the turret and another one was placed coaxially. The heavier turret meant that the chassis had to be revised. The expected weight increase was calculated at 1.5 tons, an estimation far from reality. In fact, the increase turned out to be more than double the planned weight increase, 3.5 tons. As a result, the front was reinforced, 
the shock absorbers were replaced with improved ones and the steering mechanism was changed. The tracks were slightly widened, reducing the ground pressure by 25%, a much needed improvement. Changes to the driver's hatch was also made. The hatch received a double prism periscope, but the driver did have a harder time getting in and out of the tank. This was because the turret traverse blocked the hatch and prevented it from fully opening up. Plates were attached over the steering gear hatches in order to make the vehicle NPC proof. The engines were replaced by the more powerful Scania Vabis 607 engines, which themselves were improved as well by replacing the carburetor with direct injection. They now deliver 340 horsepower as opposed to the 324 horsepower on the original Streetswagen M42. This also resulted in much lower fuel consumption and allowed the engines to function properly at temperatures as low as minus 25 degrees Celsius. The radio equipment consisted of three independent radios, one for internal communication, one for communication within the battalion, and one to communicate with the infantry. Just like most German wartime vehicles, a throat microphone was used for local communication. Tests proved to be successful and more modifications were added to the turret, such as a spare road wheel, smoke dischargers, and a turret basket. The idea of attaching fuel trailer to the tank was abandoned after it was made possible to hang 10 jerry cans at the back of the vehicle as it was much more practical. This would give it a wider range during mobilization, but it was eventually decided not to add the jerry cans at all. Tests were conducted with three different caliber weapons in order to measure the effectiveness of the turret armor. Firstly, a 20mm tube cannon was fired. A tube cannon was a gun inserted into a larger caliber one, usually used during practice in order to reduce cost. The 20mm rounds proved unable to penetrate the turret front. However, the sides were consistently penetrated from a distance less than 300 meter. Secondly, a Bofors 37mm anti-tank gun was fired. It was able to penetrate the armor at all sides at a distance of less than 750 meter. Lastly, the 75mm gun of another Streetswagen 74 was fired. It was able to penetrate the turret mantlet from a distance of 1400 meter and caused significant damage to the interior. Its effective distance could quite possibly be more, but this was not tested. After the design was completed, the production of the two prototypes could begin. The first prototype had a wooden mock-up turret roughly presenting how the scr 74 would look like. The same ammunition as on the PVKV M43 was used, which made production even cheaper. After satisfactory tests, manufacturing the production series of Streetswagen 74 began in 1957. 225 vehicles were ordered, and the orders were gradually spread among the companies Heglunds, Ossoner, and Landsberg, which produced military equipment. Two variants of the STRV-74 were produced, the H variant and the V variant. The H variant was based on the STRV M42TH and the V variant on the STRV M42TV. The differences between these versions being only minimal. The gearboxes differed from each other, one being mechanical and the other hydraulic. The order was fully completed in 1960. The SDR-V-74, just like all other Swedish Cold War tanks, never saw combat. They were dispersed among four armored brigades, each receiving 48 tanks. The crew consisted of four, commander, a gunner, a loader, and a driver. Even though the SDR-V-74 was originally designed as a light tank, the military decided to turn them into infantry support vehicle in the 1960s. Their numbers started to decline when the new IKV-91 entered service as it was much more efficient in its role of infantry support. The new 90mm gun it was equipped with provided significantly better anti-armor capabilities than the 7.5cm cannon used on the STRV-74. The remaining STRV-74 were either stored and kept as reserves or dedicated to other secondary roles. The very last tanks were retired in 1984. Some of the turrets were recycled and placed on bunkers along the coastline, staying there up until the late 90s. The Swedish military considered the project to be a success. Had they bought the French AMX-13 instead, their expenses would have been roughly 8.5 million US dollars higher, quite a considerable amount. Opinions on the tank, however, still remain mixed. The profile of the vehicle was quite high and the torsion bars were heavily stressed under the turret's weight. Many crew members had positive reflections about the vehicles, 
maintaining that as soon as you had come to know their personality, they would function properly. A few STRP-74s have survived to this day and are currently stored or on display at the Arsenalen Museum, the Föhringen P5 Museum, First Forest Museum Boden, the Kupinka Tank Museum, the Hesselsholm Museums, the Gotland's First Forest Museum, the Saumur Museum, and the American Armor Foundation Museum. Some were also used as targets on firing ranges. This concludes our look at the Stritzwagen 74. If you like what we do and want to see more, remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on a single video. If you want to contribute more directly, consider donating on Patreon or PayPal, or joining our channel's membership. It helps keep the lights on and allows us to improve the quality of our videos. Until next time, keep us in your sights!